Welcome to Beyond Money Podcast, your source for cutting-edge ideas about how to pay and be paid without using money or banks. We talk about the dysfunctions of conventional structures of money and banking, and we present alternate ideas about and solutions to the money problem. Listen to these interviews and escape conventional thinking about money. We're very pleased to have with us today Ron Whitney, who is currently the President and CEO of IRTA, the International Reciprocal Trade Association. IRTA is the premier trade association of, and advocate for, the commercial trade exchange industry. Prior to assuming the leadership of IRTA in 2007, Ron founded and ran his own exchange for 15 years. And during his 12-year tenure as head of IRTA, Ron has managed to build up the association membership from 32 to about 100 today. Ron also has a BA from George Washington University and a JD from the Delaware Law School of Widener University. Often referred to as barter exchanges, the scores of commercial trade exchanges operating around the world today provide their member businesses with a way of trading with each other without the need to use conventional money. They do this by maintaining a ledger of member accounts on which credits from sales offset debits from purchases in a process called credit clearing. Together, the scores of trade exchanges operating around the world enable moneyless trades worth several billion dollars annually. Welcome, Ron Whitney. Hello, Tom. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your podcast. Well, we're honored to have you with us, Ron. Uh, Given your long experience in the industry, I'm sure you can provide our listeners with a lot of insight as to how it has evolved and what's going on today. I'd like to start by asking you to give us a bit more history of the trade exchange industry and your own involvement and experience in it. Sure. Uh, Your question about the history couldn't be more timely since IRTA is uh, celebrating its 40th anniversary now in 2019. We actually started the organization way back in 1979. But the history of the organized barter industry dates back in the United States to actually 1960 is when the first debit credit system was created by a fellow named Mac McConnell in Los Angeles. Many trade clubs followed Mac's lead in the 60s. And in the 1970s, uh, there were a lot of franchise or type companies that expanded the trade exchange concept even to the East Coast. As the systems grew and the economy went bad in the late 70s, if you remember the late 70s, we had 20% interest rates. People turned to barter at a level that we've really never seen before. And the IRS started to pay attention to what was going on in the industry. And the founders of IRTA were very concerned at that point Uh, very similar to what's going on right now in the cryptocurrency world in terms of regulation. Uh, The founders were concerned about uh, barter trade dollars being classified as securities and whatnot and being regulated by the SEC. So they took a very proactive stance and lobbied Washington and successfully got a congressman from Ohio, Bill Gratison, to introduce a bill that effectively legalized the barter industry. And that was codified in the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982, which basically uh, categorized barter exchanges as third-party record keepers and mandated that we send out uh, IRS 1099B forms verifying the gross amount of sales of every member of a barter exchange. So TEFRA, which is the Tax Equity Fiscal Responsibility Act, basically legitimized, legalized our entire industry back in 1982. Yeah, that seems like a key event in the history of uh, the evolution of the trade exchange industry uh, because that basically got the the recognition 
that trade credits are not actually a way of uh, getting around the tax liability and are not uh, really securities. So this made a big difference in terms of the regulatory environment in which the trade exchange industry operates. Yeah, it's a huge so, piece of the credibility of our industry. You know, oftentimes when people hear the word barter for the first time, they think there's something uh, inappropriate or under the table going on about it, but it's the direct opposite. We are perfectly legalized, recognized alternative form of commerce in the United States. Excellent. Yeah, that's very important to, uh, to emphasize. So how did you get involved in this business, Ron? My background is in the law, insurance, and higher education. And back in the early 1990s, I had a small marketing company of my own uh, selling uh, various local advertising to merchants. And of course, I started doing one-on-one -on -one trades myself. I trade $5,000 of advertising in a local newspaper for a $5,000 credit at a, at a local restaurant. And I just thought it was the neatest thing in the world, the one-on-one -on -one trades. But then I learned about these things called uh, barter exchanges that had third-party bartering, where you weren't obligated uh, to, to buy from the company that you sold to. You basically earned these trade dollars in your account from your sales, and you could spend them on anyone in the barter network. I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Um, but I frankly was a tad skeptical back then, so I did a lot of due diligence, and I flew around a country, and I met with uh, the best barter exchange owners I could found, find, and I was blown away by, by their business model. Uh, they were doing millions of dollars of trading. They were providing a valuable service to their members. So I went back and said, I, I got to do this, and I took the entrepreneurial plunge, and I created my own barter exchange in Wilmington, Delaware, in the Philadelphia area from scratch in January 1993. I built it up to one of the top East Coast barter exchanges by the mid-2000s. Uh, I was on the IRTA board at that time, and uh, it just so happened that the um, my predecessor at IRTA stepped down from her position in September of 2007, which was the very time that I was selling my interest in my barter exchange. So uh, in, in September 2007, the board appointed me president and CEO of IRTA, and I've enjoyed the ride ever since. Well, you've done a great job with it, I must say. It's important for our listeners to understand, uh, even though we call these exchanges barter exchanges, uh, they don't do barter. As you pointed out, it's, it's a multilateral thing. You don't have to find somebody who has what you want and also wants what you have. You can sell to one and buy from another or vice versa. So the barter exchange actually plays the role of the manager of the exchange vis-a-vis -vis right. the membership agreement that each member signs with the, the managing barter exchange. Right. And when you, when you talk about uh, trade exchange being a third-party record keeper, basically uh, what that involves is allocating credit lines to qualified members on behalf of the other members. So it's basically the members that are extending credit to one another. Not so any, not but, but granting authority to manage that credit extension to the barter exchange itself. Exactly, exactly. Now, when you pitch uh, the idea of uh, trade exchange membership uh, to a prospective member, uh, what do you pitch as the main advantages of membership? To answer that question, we need to peel the onion back a little bit and, and appreciate and look at the underlying premise behind trade exchanges to begin with. I mean, trade exchanges are designed to maximize the unused capacity that virtually all businesses have. Not all businesses out there are working at 100% capacity. So unused capacity can be uh, in the service business uh, the accountant who's only billing 25 hours a week when he could be billing 40 or 50. If we're talking about the products kind of field, it could be a furniture store that's uh, slow in their sales or, or has excess inventory, okay? So trade exchanges are, are business networks that provide additional business 
and sales for their members. A barter exchange is trying to get a member between 5 and 15, 20% more business a year through trade. The idea is to complement the existing financial structure that's out there, not replace it, simply complement it. Yeah, well, uh, how do you do that? Well, as you touched on, barter exchanges extend credit, and, and they have these things called trade dollars, which are their units of credit. So they basically you know, are setting up a system, an alternative financial system, a private currency system, if you will, that's accepted by the IRS to increase the amount of sales that a company has, which in turn then preserves the cash flow of that business, because the idea is to take the trade dollars that you earn and purchase goods and services that you're currently paying cash for, okay? When you do that, you have more money in your checking account. Two benefits are additional business, preservation of cash flow. Right. So, so these uh, these trade exchanges provide an additional form of payment in the form of trade dollars. Yes. Yes. And it's interesting. Trade dollars can also be an excellent debt resolution vehicle. Oftentimes, when when you build a barter exchange with enough members in it, thousands of members, you'll find that Company A owns owes Company B cash dollars from a prior transaction before the barter exchange existed. They can settle that account with trade dollars. The other thing is, and, and this is a point that we probably should emphasize more, is that when you belong to a barter exchange, yes, you get additional barter business, no question, but you also get additional cash business. I mean, think of the landscaper who's, who's you know, doing the lawn or planting shrubs at, at the lawyer's house. He puts a sign out front with his pickup truck he gets four calls from, from the neighbors in the community that want to use them. But those neighbors aren't members of the barter exchange. So the landscaper now gets cash business from the barter network business that he first initially got. Okay, well, uh, from your standpoint at the center of Moneyless Exchange, uh, what is the present status and future prospects for commercial trade exchange industry? Well, overall, uh, the barter industry, and when I say the barter industry, I'm talking about retail exchanges that we've focused on thus far. We're, we're talking about complementary currency organizations. We're talking about counter trade and corporate trade companies. But overall, the barter industry is very healthy. I mean, like any other industry, you have many companies that are experience, experiencing tremendous growth while others are maintaining the status quo, and yet a minority are actually seeing a downturn. So it's a mixed bag, but overall, we're doing well. So what have been some of the biggest challenges that the trade exchange operators have had to face? And uh, what do you see as the greatest untapped opportunities? First of all, on the exchange level, the challenges that, that business owners are facing right now focus on the fact that there's so many alternative uh, competitive options for a barter exchange out there in the high tech society that we live in. I mean, think of uh, the Groupons of the world. Uh, think of Expedia and Travelocity. And so there's other competing types of businesses that deal with this unused capacity driving force. The other thing is, you know, small businesses are only going to allocate X amount of dollars to business organizations. They can join the Chamber of Commerce. They can join the, join the Better Business Bureau, Groupon, on and on and on. And they're only going to join a couple. So we have to be very careful about articulating the benefits of what we do to make us stand out. Uh, the other challenge that's going on is the shift in advertising in the marketplace. Traditional forms of advertising are not as attractive as they used to be. Newspapers, print media. Uh, the big thing now is digital media. Uh, our industry needs to get more of that digital media. We have to appear you know, current and relevant to the marketplace, to our potential members, and we're working hard at that. Okay, so 
for example, looking back at the uh, the advertising, traditionally trade exchanges have had access to radio stations and newspapers uh, as advertising channels. They could they could have them as members and then bargain uh, those services. But as you point out, uh, advertising is now shifted to online sources, uh, which are typically big outfits like uh, Facebook and Google and, uh, and the others. So it seems like that's been a major shift that has been uh, detrimental to the trade exchange business in, in advertising. Yeah, th these are no doubt challenges to our industry. We can overcome them, though, by providing aggressive uh, sales, bringing in new members, you know, providing more alternatives to our members, and of course, providing excellent customer service vis-a-vis -vis good brokers. You know, we've learned through the years that our industry is not uh, something that works well purely on the internet. Uh, you need uh, human contact, you need the physical contact of brokers who are interfacing with the members trying to put together new new barter transactions. You know, the members of a barter exchange are very busy during their business hours. They're not thinking every moment, geez, how do I spend my trade dollars? If they're not getting a call from a broker, their account will, may be stagnant for too long. You know, that's not a good thing. So the companies that grow in this business have fantastic broker services and strong sales. Right. It seems to me that the key going forward is to find some way to combine the personal, uh, the small scale, the trust that comes from personal interactions with the uh, new high technologies. And uh, this is a challenge I see. What are some of the challenges you see going forward? And what about the untapped opportunities? Well, you know, on an industry level, the challenge that we face is that, you know, we still have a system that basically has hundreds of different barter exchanges spread out through the country and in internationally. And, and they're all basically their own fiefdoms, if you will. They all have their own private currencies and they don't interact as much as they should. We've done a good job at IRTA through our own inter exchange platform, Universal Currency, to provide a platform for that interaction. But the reality is we're missing an opportunity to unify ourselves. We're much stronger if we, if we cooperate and work together than we are in this current situation where we have hundreds of separate barter exchanges doing their own thing in their own geographic area. You know, you talk about untapped opportunities. If we could come together as a unified industry, think of the power that would have with Fortune 500 companies and bringing in the consumer sector, which is something we've always been interested in. So this division that we've had as a bunch of entrepreneurs spread out all over the place, you know, doesn't do us any good. We really need to, you know, set those those geographic interests aside and, and come together, you know, to, to improve the entire industry and raise it to a level that we, we've never seen before. Yeah, it sort of puts in mind uh, the banking business, you know, where you had in the old days uh, small local banks and uh, eventually the banks figured out that they needed to work together so that if I, if I wrote you a check on my bank and you wanted to deposit it in a different bank, uh, the two banks had to talk to one another to resolve those obligations uh, amongst themselves. Uh, what about franchising, Ron? I know there have been uh, a number of trade exchanges that have uh, sort of uh, consolidated by buying up smaller trade exchanges and joining them into one system. Is there much of that going on? Um, as you know, there's a couple companies that have focused solely on the franchise model. Franchising helps solve the problem we're talking about to a certain extent, as long as those franchisees are quality exchanges that are bringing in uh, a good number of new members and are doing a good job brokering. Oftentimes, though, what you find in a franchise model is, again, it's a mixed bag. 
you know, you have some strong offices, some medium offices, and some weak offices. So it's all a function of, of the strength of the franchisees as to whether that's going to solve some of these issues or not. Okay, well, you, you mentioned universal currency. Uh, this has been uh, IRTA's way of trying to get beyond the local limitations and uh, get trade exchanges to work together to some extent. Can you tell us how that works? Yeah, um, if you remember the old uh, late 1990s, when the internet was sort of in its infancy, uh, we were all excited about the possibilities of the internet. We didn't know where it was gonna go per se. So a group of people in URTA got together and said, wow, this is a great opportunity to create a universal platform, basically a trade exchange for trade exchanges, where they can trade amongst themselves, list, post list really good items in their exchange, uh, not have to go through a direct reciprocal agreement that had been done in the past, and, and basically then allow exchanges to buy goods and services outside of their geographic area, and sell their goods and services to areas outside of their immediate area as well. So the idea was that this would create that model that would bring everybody together in a utopian world. And we would all march into, a, into the future arm in arm and, and uh, show the world the power of barter. It's been 22 years now since UC was created. UC's doing better than ever right now. We're doing about 1.3 million a month in trade, which is fantastic. And that's based on having 100 exchanges participating in UC. So UC is a great model, um, but it's, it's a barter exchange that also has the same difficulties that other retail exchanges do in terms of non-performing goods, non-performance and this and that. And sometimes the barter exchanges go out of business. So, you know, it, it's the benefits far outweigh the detriments with UC. Uh, we want to grow UC. And one of the things we're actually looking to do is expand it beyond traditional barter exchanges. Bring in non-barter related companies. Uh, we've grown to the extent that we think we have enough value to attract those companies. And, and that's something we hope to do in the next couple of months. Okay, so walk me through a typical transaction. Let's suppose I'm a member of a trade exchange here in Tucson, and uh, I don't find what I'm looking for here in Tucson. Uh, how can I get access to what's being offered in other parts of the country? Yeah, well, hopefully your exchange in Tucson belongs to UC. So... They understand what it is you're looking for. Maybe you're looking for a hotel in Denver. Uh, we have multiple exchanges in the Denver area. The broker for your Tucson exchange can go on the UC site, look at the Denver hotels, contact you, put together the deal, and your local account will be debited the amount of that Denver hotel. And the barter exchange has an internal pass-through UC account that they're going to debit and credit. And so you get to go to Denver, spending your local currency through the pass-through account in UC. Then the Denver exchange, they don't have to buy from the Tucson exchange. Again, it's third-party bartering. So the Denver exchange might buy a, an original painting from a barter exchange in Hartford, Connecticut, and have it shipped over to Denver. Their UC account's going to be debited. Hartford account's going to be credited. And just like a normal retail exchange, it just goes on and on and on. And we extend credit in UC as well, based on the trade history that each company has in UC. The credit lines generally come out to about 70% of your annual barter sales within UC. So your credit allocation algorithm for extending credit to trade exchanges uh, is based on their past performance. Correct. How long in business, lack of any ethics complaints, et cetera, et cetera. It's about a criteria of 15 different things. But the, the gross sales is the biggest item, is, is the heavily 
weighted item. So I can't go directly to the hotel in Denver and make a purchase through my trade exchange. I have to go through a broker. Yes, yes. Oftentimes, the member of the local exchange won't even know that the transaction was placed through UC. They're just darn happy that they got a hotel on trade in Denver vis-a-vis their local exchange. So like banks clearing obligations amongst themselves, UC is a way for trade exchanges to clear obligations amongst themselves. Right. And actually, UC becomes a wonderful selling tool for that local exchange as well. Uh Because when your Tucson exchange is out talking to prospects, they can say, look, we belong to this organization, Universal Currency, that's part of IRTA, that has 100 members across the country and internationally. So if you don't see something that you want right here in Tucson, chances are good that we can find it on UC outside of the Tucson marketplace. How do trade exchanges manage to involve individuals and other non-business participants? Is that being done to any great extent? And how do you foresee their greater future involvement in the credit clearing process, either within the existing trade exchanges or otherwise? Well, you're talking about how to bring in the consumer side again here. Consumers and sole proprietors have always been welcome to join any retail trade exchange, as long as they have a product or service that's considered in high demand. And the industry in general has always looked at different ways to to get the consumer side more active. Um, You've heard of these loyalty plans that have been designed by various companies in an effort to bring in the consumer side. Um, Those have worked to some limited degree. But in the end, you know, the question becomes, what does the individual consumer really have that's viable in terms of selling in a, you know, in a barter exchange? Uh, oftentimes that's limited. If, if your grandmother knits sweaters in her basement and she knits four sweaters a year, is she a good candidate for a trade exchange? Um, when three of those sweaters go to her nieces and nephews. So, The consumer side is something that has great interest, but it potentially has limitations as well. Yeah, I understand. Well, typically consumers uh, might also be employees. And I know there are some trade exchanges uh, that manage to uh, involve employees of their members. How is this done? That's done through uh, the corporate member creating sub accounts for the employees, which is an excellent way that brings in the consumer side. But of course, the consumer has to be an employee of that that member company. Uh So so say say the member is an auto dealership with 20 employees, and they might create a a trade dollar bonus program for uh, the people who had the most sales on a monthly basis at the dealership. And instead of paying that employee in a cash bonus, they they set up a sub-account and they put their bonus in that account on trade, that employee can then spend those trade dollars anywhere in the system, just like any other member, even though they don't have their own barter account per se. Well, that sounds like an excellent way to involve uh, people that, that don't have businesses or aren't professional service providers. Right. Uh, and and if you do it right, that, then the word spreads and you get more consumers as a result of that not yeah. to mention more members. To what extent is this being done and how can it be expanded? A lot of it is tied to, you know, again, having the larger companies in that, that have a significant number of employees to make the program work. But, but heck, even the smaller businesses, uh, a mom and pop plumbing company can, can do it as well, right? So with one or two employees. So it's just a, a function of, um, in, you know, educating our members that this is a viable option out there. So along those same lines, uh, what ideas do you have for educating the general public about alternative exchange mechanisms? How can we go beyond uh, uh, business to business? And uh, what can be done to make people more aware of the possibilities of moneyless trading? Well, 
Erda, as you know, is dedicated to spreading the good word of, of, of barter. And we do that as best we can with the limited budget that we have. I mean, we've been on CNN and highlighted in newspapers and USA Today and that sort of thing. The other thing is we, we certainly have been extremely proactive with our advisory memos and industry publications, you know, that, that point out uh, very important topics in our industry. A lot of times those are picked up by the national media as well. We also have, as you know, our own uh, internal educational programs, the Certified Trade Broker, CTB, and we just last week released the Certified Trade Executive, CTE, online program, which we're very proud of because you need to have educated barter exchange owners and managers out there as well. It's not just the brokers that need to be educated. The owners must be aware of the key issues of this industry as well. And lastly, I think you'll be interested in this. Because of all the work that ERT has done in the last 40 years, we have an extensive uh, resource library. And certainly in the last 12 years, we've created dozens of advisory memos. And with the creation of the CTE last week and the release of it, we feel that we have enough uh, of a body of work now to create a legitimate university level program on barter alternative currencies and credit clearing. And just this week, I started approaching universities on the East Coast about this, and, and we're determined to get this accepted at the university level and expand it across the country. Uh, it can be taught by multiple people within ERTA and in multiple geographic areas. So we're excited about that too. Excellent. I'm happy to hear that. Now, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin have been uh, all the rage now for about 10 years and, and becoming more and more a topic of conversation and uh, you find articles and books about this. What is ERTA doing to differentiate uh, cryptocurrencies from credit-based mechanisms like trade exchanges use in credit clearing? Yeah, um, as you know, with the rise of cryptocurrencies, ERTA has taken a very concise position on this. We view the rise of cryptocurrencies and blockchain as a risk to and also an opportunity for our industry. Now, that might be confusing. How can you have two at once that are technically opposed to each other? We all agree that the cryptocurrency sector is evolving and changing virtually weekly, okay? So we don't know, none of us know what it's going to look like two years from now. Uh, there's been tremendous changes. People say that we're in the third or fourth generation of the technological development of crypto. It's certainly not now what it was four years ago. But on the opportunity side, we're still observing it closely and following it to see if there could be an opportunity for our industry with private, fixed price, non-speculative, dedicated use cryptos. Now, that's a mouthful, but I mean, there's been some recent SEC decisions that have actually approved private fixed price cryptos that follow those guidelines. So that may provide an opportunity for our industry. Um, obviously, cryptocurrency has a transparency element that's attractive. So we don't know, but we're keeping an eye on it on the opportunity side. On the risk side, our practical risks in today's society of a barter exchange incorrectly representing that their, their trade exchange is a digital or virtual currency, okay? You've had some trade exchange owners who have come out and kind of jumped on the crypto bandwagon and tried to brag that their barter system is, is the first virtual currency that existed, if you will. Well, that's incorrect. We're simply a debit and credit system. And banks, the traditional banking sector, merchant services, banks are very concerned 
about the money transmission element of cryptocurrencies. So <laughs> what's happened is some banks have shut down the credit card facilities of barter exchanges who are misrepresenting themselves as a, as a digital currency. We've had situations where barter exchanges have lost their banking credit line, cash credit line facility has been shut down because of that. So barter exchanges have to be very careful how they represent themselves. We are not cryptocurrencies. We don't have stored value. And there's a number of other key items that differentiate us too. Yeah, that's, that's a very important point. Thanks for bringing that out, Ron. So many economists and politicians are warning that another financial crisis like that we experienced in 2008, is on the horizon. What impact do you expect such a crisis to have on the commercial trade exchange industry? Well, I always say the barter industry does well, whether it's a good economy or a bad economy. And the reason why I say that is that even in a good economy, there's still a degree of unused capacity out there, right? Think of the hotel owner in, in a good economy, maybe he's operating at 95% occupancy. In a bad economy, he's at 65%. But even in the good economy, he's still got 5% unused capacity, 5% empty rooms. But hey, there's no question that in a, when the economy goes bad, the degree of unused capacity increases. So yes, barter exchanges tend to do better in a bad economy, but they also do well in a good economy because there's a degree of unused capacity. One of the interesting things when you talk about the history of the industry, you know, you go back to the late 70s when you had those interest rates at 20%. I mean, <laughs> was, that was one of the biggest times of barter because people were looking to do one-on-one -on -one trades uh, uh, you know, to, to avoid the 20% interest rate that was out there. Yeah, it's important to, to emphasize that trade exchange lines of credit are typically interest-free. There's no interest charge on a debit balance. And uh, this is a, a major selling point and a major advantage of membership in a trade exchange. Basically, uh, it enables a, a business to finance their accounts receivable interest-free. In a high-interest environment, uh, this can be very, very significant. Yeah, uh, it's a point that probably is not emphasized enough in our industry, the credit extension uh, benefits of, of organized trade. It's phenomenal. Um, when credit gets tight, as you know, banks will not lend money to small businesses. So why not go to your barter exchange if, if you're that car mechanic and you want to build a new bay, cost $30,000, don't go to the bank, go to your barter exchange and see if they'll extend you the credit to build that bay. Exactly. You, you have to be careful about that, however. With the trade exchange, credit is supposed to be short term and uh, you want to monetize the value of the goods and services that are available and ready to sell. Well, you have to be prudent about the, the credit line extension. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that auto repair service that you're considering extending $30,000 credit line to does thirty dollars to $50,000 of business sales a year in the system. Obviously that minimizes your credit risk. Um, if it's a masseuse who charges you know, $50 for a massage, and she needs a $30,000 addition on her, her massage studio, it's going to take you a decade to ever get repaid. <laughs> right. So. right. So I, I've written a lot about the credit allocation algorithm. Uh, and every trade exchange, it seems to me, has their own credit allocation algorithm that they use in assigning credit lines to their members. Has this been a problem uh, individually for the trade exchanges? and collectively for those that participate in UC? Has the credit line extension in general been an issue? Is that what you're asking? Well, the non-uniformity of uh, the credit allocation practices between the different trade exchanges, that's what I'm talking about. I, I think most exchanges use a system similar to UC based on annual sales 
and also based on common sense within their system in terms of what goods and services have the highest demand. Every exchange is a little different on that front. So you quickly learn which companies are in high demand that warrant a good credit extension. I'll give you a specific example. When I had my exchange, uh, we signed up the, the opera house in the city we were in. And I thought, what a fantastic new member that is. Everybody's going to storm the doors of that opera house. We're going to do thousands upon thousands of dollars of sales. Nobody bought any opera tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why they must have been, you know, rock and roll fans or country music fans, but it didn't work. So, you know, you, you might bring in that auto mechanic and you might think that he's going to be in high demand. But until he has the actual sales, you're, you're not sure. Right. Right. So you have to be careful at the beginning when a new member comes in. Right. But if if it's the orthodontist who has five offices in Tucson. And each office has 10 chairs in it. And he has two vacation homes, one in Los Angeles and one in San Diego. I think you're probably going to be pretty comfortable extending him a significant line of credit. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that it's important to exercise due diligence with a new member, first of all, to assess their earning capability in trade credit and also to evaluate their overall solvency. Is, is there danger of this member going out of business anytime soon? Uh, what are the typical procedures that trade exchanges use to do that? Most look at what I just discussed, the actual internal demand for the product or item in the system. If they're smart, they'll get a personal guarantee from the business owner, which hopefully will protect them in the event their corporation goes under. You know, a lot of it's based on reputation. Some exchanges even will get a um, credit history, run a credit report, yeah. which can be helpful. But you never know about that. You know, in my exchange, I had some of the best members I, I had didn't exactly have the best credit rating in the world, but they took care of their barter. They paid it off on time and, and were anxious to do barter work. So you, some of the typical criteria that you look at don't always apply in the barter world. You know, on the flip side, I can tell you a story. When, when I had my exchange, I had the famous bookbinders seafood restaurant in Philadelphia. Uh -huh. And they were minus $70,000 with me. And I thought, wow, no, no worries with that. This is bookbinders. We, they can pay that off in a second. Well, guess what? They, they went bankrupt. <laughs> uh -huh. So, so you know, you never know. But if, if that happens, the good exchanges have a bad debt reserve account that's that's basically taking trade dollars from, uh, you know, membership fees and, and transaction fees and sign up fees and put it in a fund that basically zeroes out that account that that went under. Uh, and when you do that, you're still maintaining the integrity of the system. You still have a zero based system. And life goes on. Right. Right. That's prudent. Every business has to have a reserve for bad debts that can be used to write off debts that cannot be collected. Well, Ron, thank you. Uh, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners before we close? Yeah, uh, we touched on it in the, in the beginning. It's just important to emphasize that vis-a-vis -vis the, the TEFRA Act, uh, organized uh, barter, is a legalized industry in the U.S. Internationally, most uh, other jurisdictions have, have taken the U.S.'s lead on that. Uh, so, so we have something that legitimizes our industry that's, that's very powerful to the business world. Uh, the other thing is I touched on that, that these are important times for our industry to try to come together as best we can. And, and we're, IRTA's working hard on that. We have universal currency that helps on that front. Uh, we're going to create an API where other exchanges can interface with the UC software six weeks from now. Uh, we want to bring in the corporate sector, the consumer sector, like we talked about, to expand the base. Uh, and we're going to continue to, to provide important education to the industry and the public at large. The reality is that our business 
creates miracles every day. We turn unused capacity into purchasing power. It's, it's an amazing business tool that every type of business should participate in at some level to, to, to improve their own business. Okay, well, a couple of final questions come to mind. You mentioned earlier the, uh, the IRTA library. Is that accessible to just members or is it open yes. to anyone? If you go to IRTA.com, in the upper right-hand corner is the library tab. We have about 65% of our resource library is listed there or leads you to another document, okay? 35% of what we've done is not online, but the bulk of it is. And they're really important instructive materials for anyone who's interested in this industry or anyone who's in it. And I highly recommend people go there and use it. Well, thank you for that, Ron. Uh, I'm glad to know that those materials are accessible generally and that people can educate themselves about moneyless exchange uh, by consulting that resource. Well, we've been talking today with Ron Whitney, President and CEO of the International Reciprocal Trade Association. Thank you, Ron, for being with us today and sharing your vast knowledge and insights about innovative options for the exchange of value. Thanks for having me, Tom, and thank you for all you do to help our industry. You know, your book, The End of Money and Future of Civilization, is a highly recommended resource on our website, and you've been a tremendous advocate for our industry, and we thank you for that. Well, thank you, Ron. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks.